So I'd like to uh, introduce Nina Walden and Travis Harley. Uh, Nina is uh, Vice President for Institutional Advancement at the College of Creative Studies in Detroit. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, she has increased the aspects of college fundraising program. Under her leadership, the college has raised nearly $90 million in the last eight years. She serves on the five-person leadership She's a resident of Grossport Farms, graduate of DePaul University in Chicago, and she was named the John Moore Outstanding Fundraising Executive by the Greater Detroit Association of Fundraising Professionals in 2016. She is committed to enhancing her community through the other organizations that she also supports, um, including serving on the board of Chandler Park Conservancy. Travis, who works at CCS fundraising, which totally confused me. It's super me. confusing. Yeah, yeah. It, totally, it totally confused me. I was extremely embarrassed when I asked him if he was working with alumni. He let me know. It's not me. <laughs> um, he's in his 14th year. He recently moved to San Francisco from Chicago, which I thought was an incredible commute. He's the yes, Very very nice. Um, he's a member of the Chicago chapter of Association of Fundraising Professionals uh, on the board of directors. Uh, he serves on the board of Journeys Within Our Community, a nonprofit organization working in Southeast Asia to improve living conditions in local communities. And he earned a Bachelor of Arts in Economics in German from Rho He's a uh, he's a homeboy. So we welcome you back. And we uh, thank you both for first new presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's a full room. This is going to be fun. Uh, so let's get that out of the way. I'm from CCS, and so is Nina, the College <laughs> for Creative Studies and CCS Fundraising. So once that confusion is out of the way, I think we'll be all set. Um, thank you for being here. I wanted to, um, just to get us started, go over a couple of objectives to start us off today, what we want to accomplish. And I want to start by inviting everyone here to speak up. Um, we are going to have a, you know, Nina and I are going to start out with some information on the front of this presentation. It's going to be infinitely more entertaining and more fun if you all have questions to ask. And it's, uh, it's our goal to make sure we come out of this session with you feeling like you have the information and tools and conversations, questions answered, to be able to effectively either start or bolster your, major, your own major gifts program. So, Please, uh, start thinking about your questions, and uh, we'd love this to be more of a discussion than a presentation. And if nobody uh, asks questions, Nina and I will ask questions of ourselves. Uh, that would be a lot less, a lot less fun. Um, but just to start, if we're, if we're successful today, we want to review just a couple of principles of developing an effective major gifts program. Um, we want to understand lessons from Nina's firsthand experience at CCS College for Creative Studies and elsewhere. Um, of how major gift programs can be accelerated uh, and launched. We want to offer you all effective, really practical strategies on how to develop major gift prospects um, and how your organization can build a successful major gift program either from scratch again or um, to enhance the program that's already in place. It, just to get a sense of who's in the room for this conversation, how many of you uh, work either as a volunteer or a staff member in major gift fundraising for your organization. Great, so almost all, you're in the right room. Congratulations. <laughs> um, my second question is, um, uh, you have three choices coming up. Um, how many of you f uh, are looking to start a major gifts program and have really not yet begun? Okay, and full. Um, how many of you feel that you have some start, but it's not a fully fledged program yet? Great, um, and a balance of you feel like you have a major gifts program that's uh, pretty well underway? Raise your hand. Yeah. All right, terrific. We'll try to balance our conversation so that there's a value in it for all of you, and uh, please ask questions to make that more the case. Um, I want to start off really quickly with uh, just a definition of major gifts. And this may seem silly, right? You start off a presentation either with a joke, as was highlighted this morning, um, or the definition of the topic, and I'll spare you the Miriam Webster nonsense. Uh, but I want to start with this definition because in my conversations about major gifts, there's often a, um, a disconnect about the way that people think about it. 
Um, how many of you define major gifts at your organization by virtue of the size of the gift? Yeah, so about a third of you. Um, how many of you define it by the group of donors that are being engaged? Yeah. Um, how many of you define it by um, either method or impact? In my, so most of you by the amount. And I think when we talk about de developing a major gifts program, a major gifts program, the kind that we want to talk about today, is a program, it's a process, not an event. It's a type of fundraising. And as you would think about the process of, a, of engaging in events, or you would think about the process of engaging in direct mail fundraising, or your other annual fundraising efforts, you understand that there's planning involved, that there's a series of events, that it happens each year, and it's not just the act of receiving one gift. And so with that in mind today, we want to talk about those practices that establish and strengthen that program, and allow you the opportunity to have a steady stream of revenue. I personally think that the most effective way to define a major gifts program is by um, a personal ask for a gift that's going to have impact on your organization. So by the method of solicitation, not the amount. I often see organizations that use dollar amounts only to define a major gifts program, getting it confused over who gets credit for the $25,000 board gift that went to the event. Is it the events team or the major gifts team? That's not really as relevant as maintaining the relationship that makes that gift possible. So I just to jump in and say, uh, you know, it's also, I think, the way that you think about the donor or the prospect. So a lot of us have prospects that we are hoping will be really significant contributors to our organization that maybe aren't yet. And so um, there's a lot of value in engaging those prospects and getting that first $1,000 gift or whatever it is whether or not that falls into your monetary definition of major gifts, you know, that donor still may be a major gifts prospect if you know that they have the capacity to make a 25000 or 100000 or million dollar gift. And so that's kind of part of this process that Travis is referring to, is thinking about the person and their capacity and the steps to get them uh, into the major gifts pipeline. Absolutely. These are relationships. Uh, these are people that care deeply about your organization and want to make an investment. We'll talk more about that. Um, Nina, do you want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> your experience at CCS and how the major gifts have evolved there? Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the College for Creative Studies. We're an art and design college uh, located in Midtown, Midtown Detroit, founded in 1906. And, um, and I've been there 10 years as Vice President for Advancement. We have been very successful in our fundraising, but we do have a small team. So we're not like a Wayne State or a U of M or a hospital system that has dozens of fundraisers and dozens of major gift officers. There are about 10 of us on the fundraising side of the house, um, including our president, who I consider to be you know, our chief fundraiser, um, when he does what we ask him to. <laughs> He's good at well training. Um, so, um, Travis, can you flip back? Yeah, I can, absolutely. Okay. So, sure that... mm. yeah. so um, this is just kind of background about who we are as an institution. But I mean, I think that the idea is that we've grown and really transformed a lot in the last 15 years from more of a kind of insular, um, I would say kind of community-based um, charity with a uh, generous but limited donor pool into um, an organization that is um, having a much more significant impact on economic development and other activities in the region. And um, with that, you know, we've launched, we've gone from being just a, an undergraduate college to launching a graduate uh, program and opening a middle and high school. Uh, in the A. Alfred Taubman Center that we um, renovated and opened about six or seven years ago, and um, having a core um, small business accelerated the Detroit um, Community Corridor Center, Detroit Creative Corridor Center that works with um, small creative businesses in Detroit and also helps with creative business attraction like Shinola, which is the one we've all heard of. Our, our Detroit Creative Corridor Center helped attract them to Detroit and to CCS. So, um, so our mission has really expanded, I guess is the point, over the last 10 years. And with that, 
there has been, um, fortunately, an expansion of our major gifts program and our donor base. Yeah, it's exciting. Okay, yeah. yeah, is there another one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, from here, just talks about some of the benefits of the Oh, great. So we ran a campaign, um, as I mentioned, to renovate the A.L. Tobin Center for Design and Education um, in 2008. Um, this was a project, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the building, but it was uh, General Motors' original research and design center and news center across the street from the original GM headquarters. So it's a 760,000 square foot building that had been vacant for about a decade uh, when General Motors kind of moved it, uh, the ma majority of its offices down to the Renaissance Center. So it was a $158 million project and we had a very kind of complicated, sophisticated financing structure with tax credits and other um, funding elements and philanthropy was designated to be a $50 million component of the project. And, um, it was kind of an interesting um, time, first of all. It was 2008, um, as the economy was beginning to go south, and um, you know, uh, donors were um, feeling poor, <laughs> um, particularly our corporate donors. There were you know, just a lot of changes happening and a lot of uncertainty in the city of Detroit. And um, you know, we had to move forward because we had this um, tax credit uh, structure in place, which had a very specific timeline about you know when we had to begin and end the construction and fortunately we had the luxury of a lead gift in place um, for Mr. Taubman and so we kind of had um, that momentum that inspiration to move forward with the campaign without a planning study or any interviews I wasn't even allowed to use that word there was the F they called it the F word for feasibility study <laughs> I wasn't allowed to say it we just said okay we're gonna raise money and um, so about 30 million, we raised 58 million, about 30 million came from our board of trustees. We're fortunate to have a very generous and high capacity board. Um, at the time, um, about 13 million came from the foundation community, which really recognized the project as kind of a game changer for Midtown Detroit. It was just at the precipice of everything that's now going on in Midtown. So we were very fortunate about that. And then of course, because the building had been a General Motors building, GM made a really significant investment early on, in addition to giving us the building, and also helped us raise money from their um, corporate colleagues. So that was kind of the basis for the campaign. And so I guess the trick for us was then to take that core group of longtime supporters and use that momentum to build an ongoing major gifts program um, you know, getting those donors into the habit of making that gift or pledge on a continual basis to us, but also uh, leveraging their relationships to grow our donor base, which as I said, had traditionally been fairly small. I mean, the total gifts to that campaign were from about 270 donors or something like that. So 58 million, which is a small group. And, and CCS experience, the college's experience, um, is one that we see often that campaigns, if you have a campaign coming up, a need for one, or have had one recently, can be an opportunity uh, to develop a sustainable major gifts program. And that this campaign dynamic and the dynamic of an ongoing major gifts program have a lot in common. Uh, some of those things are in common that are important to highlight are a special case. We'll talk more about that, but if. If I, I offered you one takeaway, I think the largest stumbling block for organizations trying to establish an ongoing major gifts program uh, that can't seem to do so is they're trying to raise more money. And that's the case. It's a super compelling case, isn't it? Um, why, do, why should I consider increasing my gift from what I give each year to consider a gift of 10 or $25 million? Well, we need more money. Well, that's not, that's not good enough. Uh, the dynamic between annual giving just uh, typical annual giving is one of trust. It's a, it's a gift of um, trust and, and it's a vote of confidence in your mission. Uh, that is a, a very different from a gift of investment. And this major gift conversation is an investment conversation. Uh, this organization <coughs> has specific needs or plans with specific outcomes. We want to ask you to invest in that and be a part of it. That dynamic changes the way that you ask for these gifts 
it is essential to have in place if you're going to have this type of a project. Yeah? Yeah, your campaign, how much of it was peer-to-peer fundraising where you got some of your top people to go out all to it. Yeah, all peer-to-peer. Yeah, you know, the fundraiser's role is to develop, develop the strategy and handhold and train and go along and have beautiful materials and all of that. But it really was all peer to peer. And, you know, that's the best way. We had one matching challenge from an alumna who gave a million dollars, and we wanted to just increase our number of alumni gifts at any level. But for the most part, it was not matching, no. So as promised, as built, we want to talk about setting up a program. And with a little bit of the understanding of the context of how the college was able to expand its major giving program on the back of a successful campaign, uh, and a little bit of conversation about how we define those major gifts, we want to talk about some of the essential elements to creating an effective program. And this is sort of the summary slide. And um, where we can, I would love if we ask to have a discussion about this, ask and answer your questions. Um, and work through these sort of categories to understand where you have some of the biggest questions or some of the greatest difficulty. Uh, but just to get us started, I'll go through some of these elements that are essential to having a major guest program that's going to be sustainable and long-lasting and not just a series of coincidental, one-time, um, significant gifts. So we think about it in three parts. Uh, if you want to establish a program, or for many of you in the room, you feel like you have a program that's somewhere in the making, um, to strengthen that program, there is some planning and setup involved. I think some of the key elements that are important to focus on are knowing what you're raising money for and how much you need. That's that planning element. So um, what is the special case for major gifts, not just your overall story? How much do you need and when, and what is the impact going to be? So just as a starting point, um, that's going to allow you to have a conversation with your donors that's meaningful, and that leads them to the desire to invest in your mission in a significant way, not just a, a gift out of their pocket that doesn't hurt at all. Uh, that sort of uh, annual gift. Can I just mention, um, as it relates to that, you know, when you're between campaigns, um, meaning a lot of your donors are either paying on significant pledges or you're not officially in a big campaign, one of the tools that we use at the college is our annual capital budget or our annual operating budget. We go through and say, what are the projects that the institution is committed to this year that could be compelling to a donor, that a donor would want to see their name on, et cetera, because then the major gifts fundraising that we're doing is budget relieving fundraising, which of course your CFO and your president love. <laughs> um, you also want to establish a handful of policies and procedures uh, so that it's not a mystery how this process is going to work. These could be as simple as what kind of gifts are we going to accept? Um, uh, how are we going to record those gifts? Are verbal pledges enough, or do we need to document them? We need to document them. Um, uh, how are we going to provide recognition? Um, 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 and policies as straightforward as representatives of the organization aren't going to go out and engage donors without first being properly trained and prepared. So thinking about some policies and guidelines. Uh, and then making sure that you have the basic tools to go out and ask for money. I would add that who's going to do the work. Uh, so if you're sitting around your, uh, with your team uh, or sitting with your board and thinking about establishing your gifts program um, and adding it part-time to somebody's full-time responsibilities, it's probably not going to go great. Uh, if you have somebody with sufficient time to focus on it uh, that's being measured against it and whose full-time job is to manage those portfolios, you're going to find a lot more success. So resources are important. It's important, of course, that you identify from whom you're going to ask money and on whom you're going to focus in a major gifts program. So thinking about individuals, um, uh, identifying that group and making sure it's a manageable group to start with, that you can have high quality interaction with and be successful with. Uh, that you don't only focus on current donors, although that is where you should start, as we'll get into. Uh, but that you leave room for engaging new prospects and taking your $500 or $1,000 donor and allowing the room and the, um, the time and energy to bring that person along to be more engaged in the mission and ready to consider larger gifts in the future as they become more dedicated. Um, and then, of course, a focus on activity is required. Um, if you have materials sitting on your desk and you know who you'd like to give you money, and you don't do anything about it, 
uh, this won't work. So a focus on activity and high quality activity to engage prospects, to get in front of them face to face, and to set up organization or uh, opportunities unique to your organization that engage them in the mission and allow them an opportunity for uh, you and they to sit down, talk about what's needed, and invite their investment are really important. I have a question Please. of my consultant. That's great. So in your opinion, Travis, how important is it um, to have kind of a set, to measure your activity based on a, a set of numbers of visits, solicitations, Kind of things and really be disciplined about it and check in on it on a monthly basis and share it with the team. Really important, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that there are a couple of things that I'll, uh, thanks for getting the questions started. And as we have these up here and I answer Nina's questions, uh, please a ask questions about these. Um, and uh, we'll skip around through the presentation to help illustrate the answer to those uh, as we work through this content. But um, if you don't set up those sort of accountability benchmarks for yourself, as well as for the volunteer partners um, and the administrative partners. So you talked about uh, the president of the um, college uh, needing to be accountable for his own work. Um, those sort of measures are critical to being successful. So it's not only measurement, but accountability. And I'm sure everyone in this room that has a major gifts program or is involved in one has uh, financial goals. That's a, an absolutely essential measure. Um, you d don't stop there, though. Um, most of the work of a major gift uh, program on an ongoing basis uh, is not the ask. It's about probably 90% of things leading up to the ask, and the ask is maybe 10% of the process. So if you're only measuring 10% of it, it's a, sort of a frustrating way to demonstrate progress. So you mentioned really important things, the uh, visits, um, calls, uh, new prospects identified, and making progress along the continuum for those prospects being ready for it. How do you implement a volunteer accountability? And when you when you have someone board doing your board, you tell them up front this is the deal. You're not only get it, you're doing have to help us. You know, you have to Yeah. Well, I would say that also is key. Um, building component, meaning those trustees or board members have to, like you, value you, take your calls, first of all, in order to really be effective in helping right. you. So you have to develop that relationship, you know, and then, I mean, pleasantly persistent, right? You have to be able to, you have to feel when they're available, when they have time, when they feel good about it. You have to know when to pull back because they've got a business crisis or something else going on. Um, you know, when you're in a campaign or if they're part of a major gift formal program, then maybe you agree to, um, these are your three prospects and we're going to try to see them this month and we're going to try to solicit them in that month and here's what needs to happen in between. But it really needs to, I think, be developed on a case-by-case -case basis. And I would offer just three tips about working with volunteers and keeping them accountable in this process. The first is uh, to make sure that you treat them like major gift donors. So um, your board members, your trustees, are probably among the most generous and capable uh, of your donors. Uh, certainly, they're the closest to the inside and those that if you're starting a program or even starting your program just this fiscal year, they should be among the first that you go to. If you're going to go through the process of just asking them by having the chair stand up at a meeting and say it's time to write your check, they're never going to quite understand this process because that's not how you would treat any donor. So take the time to make sure that you sit down with them throughout the year to tell them the impact their gift has had. Sit down with them personally with a prepared, customized proposal to ask them for a gift uh, that would, is equal to or larger than the gift they gave last year, depending on their circumstances. And make sure that it's a gift to something they care about. Treat them like a donor and say thanks like you would anyone else. Um, the last is um, to make sure that you, uh, just to put it bluntly, meetings raise money. And if these uh, folks are engaged in peer-to-peer -peer solicitation or being helpful in fundraising in any way, um, having a regular scheduled meeting where not only staff, but also volunteers report on the progress and are accountable to one another, uh, that's very helpful. Um, any other questions before we keep moving through? I would love to just keep doing this. This is way better than the presentation. <laughs> Conversation with 
Um, I think the easiest way to record a, a gift agreement like that is, is with a, uh, either a pledge form or a prepared gift agreement. So uh, take a formal step, and this, there's, there's, a, there's some really beneficial gift closing strategies that can come through the use of this stuff. Think about the cycle of sitting down to ask for a gift, and they say, um, yeah, I can do that. Terrific. You should have it along with you uh, a pledge agreement for them to sign. Just the amount and the terms, how they want to pay, what they'd like, how they'd like to be reminded of it. Uh, making sure you have on there an option for anonymity or how they'd like to be recognized so that you don't have to follow up and be concerned about that later. Um, if there's any concern about it, you can talk about the way your organization treats pledges. Uh, that you know, this is a statement of intent, um, not a legally binding, binding agreement. And if you um, need to change the terms of this, let us know. But uh, in order for us to count this on our finances um, and along with our auditing practices, we need to have the gift document. If it's a more complicated gift agreement, um, you might write it up uh, specifically to them about the understanding of the gift, um, either in a letter format um, or something that looks a little bit more like a, a simple contract. And if you were to just search gift agreement on Google, just looking for a sample, you'd find several, uh, mostly university samples that are way too complicated for most, but that you can pull from uh, to sort of meet the needs of the agreement you want to make. So we talked a little bit about planning and setting goals. And I want to think of uh, setting up your program and making sure it's effectively established for, for a, a little while to help guide our questions. Um, the first thing that I would think about when establishing um, planning is making sure you have that specific case, that you know that what you're raising money for, that you have realistic expectations of what your major gifts program is going to raise now, or um, um, especially if you're starting out, what is that initial goal going to be? Um, it's not reasonable, and, and some of you may have had this experience, to say we're going to start a major gifts program, we'd like it to raise a million dollars, so that's now your job. And um, let us know when it's complete. <laughs> or we have a million dollar shortfall in our budget, that's right. so we're going to raise an extra million dollars. That's right. And there's a couple things that make that strategy you know, more than on its face ridiculous. Um, one is that it takes work and time to establish these relationships and ask for gifts of this magnitude. So special gifts require some sort of special approach, a special case, or a special um, interaction. The more, the more you want out of a donor, if you want a donor to make their best gift to you, your approach should be different than the year before. The engagement should be different, the recognition should be different. Um, the approach should be special and out of the ordinary, and above all else, it should be personal. So leaving the time to make sure that you have the opportunity to get in front of them, to explain the context for why there's a shortfall or for what the specific need is, and to ask them to be a part of it is going to take time. From a complete, now I don't want to say that, you, there's certainly a dynamic of cultivating all your prospects to death and never asking, which I do not want to endorse. Uh, some of your prospects do not require this sort of engagement to ask for money. Your current board members don't need 18 months of cultivation to ask them for a gift. Uh, they may need several years of conversation and engagement to make their very best gift. But in your cycle, uh, some, a great piece of cultivation is to get that first gift from a donor. And if it feels like it's a low or a safe gift for you, that might be a good starting point. Um, in the context of planning, think about those prospects that you are going to engage this year. Have a specific portfolio of donors that are going to be engaged. Whether or not they want to engage with you is another question, um, and, and that takes some work. Uh, but identifying who those are, and for the purposes of planning, how much did they give last year, and how much do we think we can reasonably ask them for this year? That gives you a delta, a change in number that's going to help affect your fundraising planning in a smart way instead of an arbitrary way. Um, or work backward from the need you have. If your organization is at a turning point and you need uh, $500,000 or several million dollars, depending on the magnitude of your organization of investment in a new program, um, who is going to give that money and over what period of time can we make the case get in front of them and ask them for it? So thinking practically about the work involved, understanding who's going to do that work, and understanding the magnitude of that goal is part of effective planning. Um, 
it, as I said in the presentation uh, earlier this month, uh, increasing your goals, not the plan. Uh, it's the work behind it, that is. You know, what we do uh, every year when it's time to set the budget is we sit down with, you know, the team of fundraisers and each fundraiser brings their prospect list and we go through and add up what we think, you know, we can raise from each prospect each year so that what we're setting is an aspirational goal but a reasonable goal because obviously it's better to exceed your goal than not to make the goal, particularly when it's around restricted giving and it you know, impacts the operations of your organization. Absolutely. I mean, who in here um, is the sole uh, person working in major gifts? Okay, so you have a, uh, one type of a challenge. That's about a third of the room. How many of you have more than one? working on major gifts, about the other third, and I assume the rest of you have no one specifically working on major gifts, and it's sort of either a, a growing program or a uh, program that's involving people's part-time efforts. I would say in all those situations, ensuring that you have an appropriate number of prospects identified for each of you, the people engaged in major fundraising is critically important. Um, if you're, you know, we, you know, you mentioned uh, Rick, the president of the college. It's not reasonable to think that Rick is going to manage a portfolio of 100 prospects. Um, nor is it reasonable to think that Nina, who's managing the entire development staff, can carry a full university level 125 prospect portfolio either. Uh, it is reasonable to think that somebody on her team uh, is able to carry a full portfolio, as that's their full-time job to interact with, to steward and to end, solicit those specific so scale the, the magnitude of the number of people you think you're going to engage to the size of your program. And just going back to the goal size, that's going to really define how you set that goal. If you want to raise a, a mil, an additional million dollars, um, having the right number of prospects that have the capacity to do so, um, and then staffing those number of people appropriately in the time that you have to raise it um, is all part of effective planning. Yeah. What if you don't have executive uh, buy-in for this program? How do you encourage them to, like, what, what role would they have if they just don't want to do it? It's a problem to, to begin with, right? It's, it's going to be an obstacle. I'm not sure that you, you can effectively or immediately solve that. Um, what I would focus on is um, instead of trying to def define it as an onerous thing, um, ask, and, and this advice goes to uh, reluctant or um, less initiated board members as well. Um, identify specific tasks rather than broad responsibility. So if you say that just as part of our overall fundraising strategy, we're going to focus on our top 15 donors and ensure that three things happen with each of them. Um, that they're able to uh, come in and see the mission firsthand, face to face sometime this year. Uh, that we have the opportunity to have them sit down with you as the executive director or a board member and talk about our future vision of what this organization could be uh, and that we make time to sit down and ask them for a gift at some point this year. And I think you know, one of the ways to make sure you get the best partnership out of your executive team or your board is to only ask them to do things that you can't do yourself. So um, not to have them do the busy work, come to them with everything they need to be prepared, but. Uh, you know, share with them or play on their ego if that's important to them, that this is a conversation that's going to be better received from you as a leader of this organization than it is from me. I also think there are, you know, you referenced having a, a executive director or trustee involved in uh, showing the organization. So that's a real um, not scary role for an executive director to play, to give a tour with you, um, because, you know, Generally, those leadership folks are mission-driven, and so they can talk about the organization. They're selling it without even really know that, knowing they're selling it. So maybe taking it out of the context of solicitation, which you have to work up to, and just bringing it back to mission, and we're introducing new friends to the organization, might be a way to kind of ease them into it. So on the screen, keep asking questions. Um, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the tools that are required. And you know, two things I'll tell you. Um, it is important that you have the tools to support this general solicitation activity and do a little bit of planning to have those in place. Um, and that nobody's ever made a gift because of a piece of paper. 
So, um, you know, very simply, if you know who you want to give to your organization and you go out and you ask them for money, you're halfway home. So don't overcomplicate this. We're talking about best practice and some sophisticated nuance to individual challenges. But don't overcomplicate a thing. That is to sit down with somebody that cares about the organization that you care about and you're inviting them to help make the organization's future stronger. If you do that in a personal way, you're going to have good results. Board members do love to get the case data. Love the case data. the case data and it again and it. You know, it's like their security blanket. It's not quite right, so we can't ask yet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely can. But I think that's, that speaks to what you need for materials. These tools, these materials, case statement or customized proposal or the pledge card or pledge agreement that we talked about just a moment ago, uh, these are tools that facilitate a conversation. Uh, it's a leave behind and it's a reference piece. It's not the ask itself. The ask itself is a conversation between you or the board member or the executive director and the person you're speaking with to ask them to support something that you know they already care about. And if, if does anyone here find it less than comfortable to ask for big amounts of money? Yeah, the rest of you are lying. <laughs> Understand that there's a dynamic that this donor that cares about your cause, cares about your organization, cares about the community, needs you in this equation to let them know what's required and invite support that matters. You're an important part of this process. Uh, we just listened to a great conversation about the thought, the thought process of philanthropists. Uh, they are thinking about how they're going to use their assets, their time, their treasure, their ties, was the fourth T, I think, um, and how they're going to use that to change their community. You're an important part of that equation. They rely on you to guide that. And so um, think of it as a partnership, and, and it's not a holdup. Um, they aren't, shouldn't be surprised about why you're there when you're asking for money. These pieces of materials are simply a vehicle for having that conversation. Any questions about the tools you need in hand to do this work? Good, because that's the boring part. Um, how many of you feel like you have a good sense of who are in your major gift portfolio? Um, uh, are the, for those of you, uh, it, should we skip this? Does anyone want to talk a little bit about who are, are the right people to have in your portfolio, or how to, how to identify them? Yeah, see a couple of hands. Um, thinking, just general advice, if you are developing a portfolio, either a new portfolio for a new staff member, for yourself, or trying to identify who's right for a major gifts program, I would focus uh, first on keeping it small and working top down and inside out. So keep it small, work top down and inside out. So ask first those that are closest to the organization, current donors, current volunteers, current board members, who don't need to be sold on the organization, but have maybe not yet been invited to consider their best gift. Go to those people, it'll be easiest. It'll be easiest for you. They'll raise more money immediately, and it'll allow you to set up a base for the program. You could do worse if you're just starting a program than to ask for the same gift you got last year from your top 25 donors face to face. You made sure you didn't lose that gift. You established with that donor that it's face to face and you set up an opportunity to ask for more the next time. Obviously, it would be great to get more than what you got last year, uh, but that's a start, and you have to start somewhere. For most organizations, major gift prospects represent about 2 to 5% of their total donor pool, and the easiest way to figure this out for yourself is a table of gifts. How many of you know what a table of gifts are, or how many don't? There are a couple. A table of gifts is just an amount of how much is given by a donor on the left-hand side, in that chart, how many donors gave at that level? How much was received at that level? Uh, just doing multiplication. Um, and a cumulative amount on the other side. The reason this is such an important tool is I bet you, if you added this up for your organization, you would find that something less than 10% represents something more than 70% of your total funds raised. Uh, it's true for most organizations. And when you think about your donor population that way, who you should have a personal face-to-face -face conversation with, um, and who should be asked face-to-face -face become a parent. Working from the top down, a small number of donors who are often responsible for a uh, really significant portion of your budget. These should be face-to-face -face conversations. So 
what's the mix of current donors and donors that have a relationship with your organization already and just plain old rich people out there in the world? Oh. <laughs> you so, know, it used to be Oprah. Remember the I, decade of everyone wanted it. Let's get to get them if we could just get Oprah. <laughs> there's your answer. Um, so in a fully developed portfolio, do these terms make sense to everyone? Yeah? Um, the words sort of describe themselves. These are the typical stages in a major gift portfolio. If you're just thinking or you're looking for a rule of thumb of how to balance it, uh, you might have 20 of them that are just rich people. That's identification. Uh, somebody said we should be talking to this person and let's do some research and try to find an open door or a warm connection. Uh, qualification is identifying the strategy. Um, the, the next step with that donor. Cultivation is getting them more engaged in the organization, so the next step there might be a tour, it might be a sit down with your executive director, something to get them more engaged, a volunteer opportunity perhaps. If you at all times have 20% uh, of your portfolio ready for solicitation, it'll make sure that you're always asking, which is important to making sure that you have a stream of revenue coming in once you have a fully developed program. And making sure then that those people who are being asked um, are somewhere in the process of being thanked is important. Uh, how many of you have are, th are near a campaign or have recently concluded one? Okay, let me give you advice that I, I want everyone to have because it's so sad when it doesn't happen. You are in the process, or we're, excuse me, just in the process of asking people for their likely their most uh, their largest gift or their most impactful gift to your organization. Uh, they committed to some sort of a long-term commitment, three, five years of commitment. Um, the, word, the biggest missed opportunity I see is not staying in touch with them during that pledge period. Um, and then getting five years down the line and realizing their pledge just ended and I should probably call them. And you can imagine that's not going to go well. So uh, making sure that that stewardship portion is built in as part of your planning. Uh, that there is an established pipeline of communication for those that make a multi-year arrangement that you sit down with them once a year face to face so that you have the opportunity uh, to build up to the next ask and not have it feel like a you only show up when you need a check from me uh, situation. And a lot of stewardship is most impactful face to face, but you can also come up with tools you know, that enable you to manage larger groups of people um, and individual meetings. One thing that we um, launched several years ago, I guess, maybe just after the campaign wrapped up, was what we call a good newsletter. Mm -hmm. So we take um, essentially the president's um, report that he gives to the board each fall when school's back in session, and we tailor it. We take out you know, anything confidential, and we pump up all of the good news. We tailor it to a letter to our major donors. And so once a year at least, sometimes twice, they get a good newsletter from our president that just says we won this award and this great thing happened and here's the new program we launched. And you would not believe, first of all, our president was so resistant to this <laughs> idea. And then so many people came up to him and said, like, oh, that's really cool to hear about that. You know, not in the format of your beautiful, you know, newsletter, not in the format of an annual report, but just in a letter from the president saying, you're important to the organization, here's some key stuff that's happening, thank you. If you don't know where to start with a donor, um, you're not sure quite what that first conversation is, uh, create some sort of report that captures their impact on the organization and go sit down and say thank you. So, um, you know, saying thanks is a powerful tool. Yes? Absolutely, we do. For us, it's less about amount and more about who has a relationship with the donor. I mean, sometimes if the amount is big enough, it's got to be the president or a board member. But um, yeah, we try to make those personal contacts. And it's different for every donor how they appreciate hearing from you, too. Now, I have donors that text all the time. You guys <laughs> You get gifts via text, you send thank you. So, it just kind of depends on the donor. But yeah, I think that's important, that touch point. There are a couple of examples I've seen that I'll just offer. Um, I've seen things as formal as uh, Thank You Thursday, uh, where volunteers will come in and just sit down and um, uh, dial up gifts from that week and say thanks. 
uh, and you, you know, off, how many of you have reluctant uh, board members that don't want to be engaged in fundraising? Yeah, right. The, again, the rest of you are lying. Uh, everyone wants a fundraising board. It's kind of like a unicorn. Um, they're beautiful, and everybody wants one. No one's actually seen one. We understand they exist. Um, I think a, a lot of the hesitation for board members to get involved in fundraising are not having a common definition of what they think fundraising is. Right? So if you were to ask your board members what fundraising is, some would say uh, selling candy bars, some would say um, holding an event, an event planning, others would say asking my friends for money, um, none of them would say thank you uh, as, as a way, but all of those things are true. Uh, fundraising is a team sport, and we need people to fulfill all those roles. And so having people that aren't, don't feel like they have the Rolodex to leverage big relationships, but are willing to sit down and say thank you or share their passion about the organization is a tremendous way to get them involved. And this is this assumes that there are going to be some people making multi-year commitments, uh, or that aren't being asked simultaneously. If you think about your portfolio as an annual cycle, right? If if you think about needing to engage 50 donors and say thank you, introduce the next thing, and ask in a single year, this portfolio arrangement like this does. If you're thinking about asking a larger group of people for um, time-based commitments, it allows you, instead of focusing on everyone at the same time, that there are a number of people that are specifically in that stewardship phase where we're not doing anything but saying thank you. There are others where we continue to engage them, but our next step for them is to identify what their next gift will be. So these are gradations that don't imply that there shouldn't be communication that's ongoing or that they would make a gift without thanks. Are we on time? Ten minutes left? So plenty of time. Um, when you think about cultivation opportunities, how many of you feel like you do this really well? Um, most of major gift fundraising, in my experience, is based on excuses. Uh, and what I mean by that is the opportunity to sit down with a major donor um, to engage them in the mission of your organization, you feel like you need a reason. Does that feel Resonate with anybody? So identify those excuses up front. Use your, use your organization's calendar to your advantage. Um, these cultivation opportunities don't have to be standalone. They don't have to be created from whole cloth. Um, if you are having a, a, a moment of celebration at the organization, invite them. If you're looking for opportunities to give a tour and your executive director's calendar is a mess uh, and is never available, um, ask if they can identify a day a month or an, uh, an hour a month uh, during which you'll fill a room with folks for them to give a tour. Um, or a day a week during which it'll be your responsibility to get somebody there to talk about the future of the organization. Um, use existing events, even if they're fundraisers or not fundraisers, a graduation, um, an end of the year celebration, your gala event, as cultivation opportunities where you say thanks to somebody on stage or you're thoughtful about where, where and who they sit with, and that the person they sit with is prepared to share a, a message with them about their own passion for the organization, or to ask if they would join them for lunch and a tour of the facility. All of these things, there's an infinite combination, um, uh, should be uh, ideally based around the things that already happen at your organization. You, know, you do a, a wonderful things with your student galleries, your student ex ex exhibition, um, uh, as well as other things.
are hard. They're definitely um, a huge time you know, and if you're fortunate enough to have one or two, we have kind of two bookend events, but we work on them all year. I mean, I would say, how can you educate your executive director about return on investment? I mean, if you have a trustee or two that are sophisticated fundraisers that can talk about the importance of streamlining your events, um, or you know, so your executive director sees events as a tool to increase giving. It's not just about ticket selling. That's kind of what you're saying. I mean, maybe you could pitch other strategies you know, that don't involve planning a huge event that, that kind of simplify the, the time of staff. I mean, that's a tough one. I've been, you know, at large and small organizations. On the upside, if you have a natural point in the calendar and the event is this moment that you're driving decisions toward um, and you sit with folks as you would otherwise and ask for their gift and sort of point to having it in by the event so we can recognize you there as a deadline, um, it can be a useful tool in that sense. Um, if it's less about the event in some ways and more about their gift, uh, but we, it's sort of the event is the culmination of it or the celebration, that can generate some excitement um, as an excuse. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add that it's something that I've seen uh, other organizations do a lot and our organization starting to do it. We're trying to get rid of events because they're, sure. they're, we're not really getting, we're spending maybe who might be breaking even or maybe getting a little bit more. That's a great strategy. And so, for example, for the Holocaust Museum, maybe it's those 12 people out of people you're trying to increase the five thousand dollars. And again, what a great excuse, you know, to host something where people feel like an insider. If they sit down with your president, or executive director, some key program person, you know, um, they, the message they get is, "I'm important to this organization." So that's a great. Side hands over here. The, the events are always a vulnerability because they're expensive and because only a handful of them raise significant money in and of themselves. Um, from a major gift context, whether it's an existing event or a future event, the most important thing, in my opinion, is the follow-up. It's what you do after the meeting or what opportunity you set to sit with folks after they leave that room that really matters. Yeah. I just want to just to add to that point. Um, I attended two events yesterday. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, it was, I, I, made, I made four contacts at each, and so it was really great. And one of the one of the people are they're here, and so it was, it was great to follow up with them. But uh, the fact is, is that you know, there's there's 500 people there, and there's no way I can touch with all of them. Yeah. And I'm only going to get quality time with four of them, and I'm going to follow with four of them. Four is good. But but still, um, a good four, right? Right. I, I, I'm hopeful for. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, when we, we have a prospecting meeting at Monday morning after every one of our weekend yeah. events, yeah. the team drags in and we drag that list out. We go, okay, who talked to whom and who was it that we didn't expect and what happened? I mean, it's just it's a great way to get those major gifts out of the you know, is to use that event as a launching pad. But it's almost impossible to talk to all five months, you know? Like, of course. There's, there's of course. no way we, have, we did not get nearly as Share information, a call to action, a point of interest. Um, think about people at events and in your conversations. What are they interested in this conversation? What will they say yes to? Uh, um, somebody mentioned um, uh, having an event that's educational uh, about the mission, having a speaker. It's not the event itself that's important. It's uh, the personal connection and the opportunity to follow up with them. Um, we have just about uh, two more minutes, maybe take one more question. Yeah, I saw your name. I think that's it. If there is exhaustion and, and, and uh, um, solicitation fatigue is a real thing, uh, then if their five gifts last year totaled fifty thousand um, dollars, ask them once for seventy-five and, and make it clear uh, that included in that is their event sponsorship and table their golf foursome, uh, as well as their annual gift. Um, you know, of course, their trick is why do you need twenty-five thousand more dollars other than? We always need more money, and making a case that matters to them is important. But a single request, inclusive of the others, can help to combat that. 